Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Unex News Radio podcast, your news source for all things unexplained. And now, here's your host for the Unex News podcast, Margie Kay. Good evening and welcome to Unex News. I'm your host, Margie Kay, and we are here every Friday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. So thank you for joining me tonight. I just want to run over a couple of things very quickly that are new at uh, the Unex Network. If you go to unexnetwork.com, we now have a swag shop, and that at there's t-shirts, there's bags, there's drinkware, there's all kinds of stuff that is available That's and some of it is really cool. So you want to check that out. Also, Unex Magazine is out quarterly. This is our latest issue. We've got a lot of good articles in here. You want to check that out as well at unexnetwork.com. And we have a page that is dedicated to conferences, all types of paranormal conferences around the world. This is one of them that's coming up in August. It's the Midwest Conference on the Unknown. And this is the place in uh, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, where the crash happened in 1941. So, of course, they're going to be covering that subject as well as many others. And then uh, coming up is the Arkansas Paranormal Expo in October. And you want to check that out as long at, at, and as well as all of the other conferences that are coming up that are listed there. If you have a conference that you are doing or that needs to be listed, just go ahead and send it to me through our contacts at unexnetwork.com and we'll get it listed. This evening, I have a very special guest. Lisa Martin is someone that I have known for many years and I've wanted to have her on my show for quite some time. She is a lifelong resident of Missouri. Lisa is an author, historian, producer, and attorney with longstanding interests in history and the paranormal. Lisa is a producer and writer of the Dark Ozarks TV series, which is coming up, and videocast. And uh, she is also the director of the Paranormal Science Lab. That is a research group which focuses on paranormal research at historic locations. Lisa is a frequent speaker on history, the paranormal, and unexplained mysteries. Welcome to the program, Lisa. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you so much. You are a very busy lady, I see, and you've got lots of irons in the fire. Yes, so so are you. (laughs) Well, uh, like attracts like, I guess. (laughs) I think so. <laughs> well, you were involved in a conference a few years ago, and that's where I met you. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've kind of kept in touch ever since then. But let's start from the beginning. What got you interested in the paranormal? Uh, I think I think uh, a lot, like a lot of people who end up in the field, it's from personal experiences. I I grew up on a farm. Uh, not far from Joplin, Missouri, that was the site of Civil War battles. And we had strange things that happened uh, as I was growing up. So I, early on, I, I learned, you know, things happen and I wasn't scared of them, but you, it, it was accepted. It was part of sort of the, the history and the personality of, of the land. Um, later on, you know, grew up, went off to college, law school, et cetera, and focused on building a family and so forth. I'd always been interested in the subject, but not that actively. And then actually, while I was looking at a house to buy, oh, about, I don't know, 22, 23 years ago, I um, had an experience that uh, made me say, okay, I really want to find out more why these things happen. Basically what Uh happened was that we were looking at a house and it was a turn of the century arts and craft home. And the agent was taking us through. The first thing that happened is my, my ex-husband was coming down the stairs and there's like four flights of switchback stairs from the second floor down to the living room. And 
the agent and I had come on down and we're standing there talking and ghosts or paranormal activity is the last thing on my mind. I'm thinking numbers, et cetera. Right. We're talking and he starts coming down and he'll put, he would pause about every step or two and then start looking over his shoulder. And I'm wondering what in the world's going on. He finally gets to the bottom and he goes, did you guys hear that? And we're like, no. And he shakes it off. And then down in the basement, uh, there was a big open area that had the original old boiler there. And I was kind of standing in that room, just kind of looking it over and had really thick foundation walls, etc. And the other two had walked over to a side room. And as I was standing there, it's dream cold, almost dry ice cold. The distinct sensation of a thumb laid on one side of my neck and then one, Ooh. two, three, four, and then Yikes. go through the back of my neck. Um, and, you know, I was like, that's a little up close and personal. Not sure I really want to do my laundry <laughs> here. Right. Um, and so I decided I walked over to the room that they were standing in just in time to hear the uh, agent go. Now, I don't know what this room would have been used for. And I, I am clear since then. I'm empath. I, I walked to the the doorway and I just saw blood running. And one wall was all apoth old apothecary cabinets. Another wall had seven large metal sinks oh. and the largest drain you've ever seen in in the floor. And I just said, I'll tell you what it was. It was the embalming room. Yes. And uh, I turned to walk to the stairs and I could still hear her stiletto heels on the concrete running after me. And she finally says, well, I should, I should tell you that this was a mortuary back in the twenties. Uh, you know, I was like, I kind of figured that one out. Um, so, so disclosure from the real estate agent, right? Right. Yeah, she did. Um, uh, I think she was hoping she could, you know, that it, we'd still buy it. And we ended up not getting, mm -hmm. actually bought a house less than a block away though. And the irony is over time, no one stays in that house very long. Not surprising. I'll bet and not. even when, you know, I'll, you know, take walks in the evening in the neighborhood and you find yourself, you can just feel yourself being watched as you pass. And ironically then, um, Two or three years ago, I was I was doing a, a public tour of a haunted site that we manage events at. And during a little break, I heard a, a couple talking and they, they were talking about, hey, do you remember when so-and-so owned that house? And uh, from what they said, I very quickly realized that sounds like that house. So I asked them and it was. Uh, family members had owned it back in the 80s and had lots of activity. Um, oh. including poltergeist activities. So uh, my experience was confirmed there. <laughs> wow. But you that's know, the experience that made me say, okay, I want to, I want to know more about why these things happen. I'll bet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the hand on the throat would really yeah. get your attention. That it, as it, an attorney, uh -huh. as an, I have an attorney question. Okay. Is it tr is it true that some states do require disclosure about paranormal activity and some don't? Yes, uh, actually, as far as I know, New York is the only state that it has to be disclosed. Um, the only one that I know of, uh, and there there actually is a court case there um, where someone sued the a buyer so uh, sued the seller for not disclosing uh, apparently a pretty severe haunting. Um, saying that if they had realized what was going on, they would not have purchased the home. And the court finding was that that is information that should be disclosed if the, uh, if the owner knows about it. Most, uh, as far as I know, no other state requires uh, disclosure on a haunting, but most, uh, a lot of states do require disclosure if there was a murder and the owner knows about it. Okay. So you would at least know if there's a murder in the house. There right. Was a homicide. Supposed to know anyway. Yeah. Right. Right. It'd be nice if all the states would disclose, but you know, there's a lot of haunted houses that would probably never get sold. Well, that's true. But you know, I think, I think, 
I think that was true for a long time, but I, I think it's kind of changing that there, there are a lot of people who are interested in buying haunted properties now. So yeah, yes. I'm not sure yeah. in the end how many sales will be lost or not. People like you and me. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> who like the paranormal. <clears throat> I must say every house I've ever lived in has been haunted. And every every other house, all of, all of my investment properties in my office is haunted. Has that been the case with you? Uh, not everyone. Um, the house I grew up in, in fact, it's still in the family. Um, definitely haunted. Um, actually this one that I, uh, own now is haunted. It's, uh, an 1880s Victorian and it's got a couple of ladies here and a couple of men, um, that I've seen both ladies, but I have not had encounters with, with the two men, but other people have, including people who are just guests. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, we weren't expecting it. Yeah. Um, one of the funniest ones was, um, uh, was, a. Uh, when one of my sons was, oh, I, I don't know, probably junior high age. And he had a friend over to spend the night. It was the first time this kid had been over to spend the night. And he goes upstairs to go to the restroom and he comes back down. And he goes, who's the guy upstairs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was like, okay. Now, um, my sons had seen the man, but I, I still have never seen it, but. But yeah. So do these apparitions appear as full body apparitions and, and as solid or more ghostly? Uh, the man appear, uh, the one man uh, does appear uh, solid to the point people think he's real. Um, and we, we have no idea who he is. We can't, I, you can't tie it to anything with the house necessarily. I don't know if it's connected to the family, um, our family. I don't know. Um, there, there's been another, um, male apparition scene that it is not fully formed. So they, they recognize that that is an apparition and the, the two ladies are more transparent. So people, when they see them, they realize it is an apparition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you've written several books. Uh, let's just talk about haunted Carthage, Missouri. What's okay. significant about that book? Um, Carthage is, is pretty um, unique. It's had so much history. It had, it had Indian War literally in the downtown area in the 1830s. A lot of um, Civil War activity, including the town being burned twice. Um, a lot of um, mining related tragedies, etc. And really the most of the downtown area has activity. Really? Yeah. So when you go to investigate these sites, do you go alone or do you go with a team? Um, I, I, I have a team, a paranormal science lab. And uh, so usually several of us will go together. I, I don't usually advocate you know, investigating alone, especially in locations you're not familiar with. Um, right. one, just practical safety reasons. And two, you may encounter something that's a little more, um, uh, aggressive or, um, ill will towards you than, than expected. I just think it's always a good idea to have someone around. Mm -hmm. Percentage wise, how many of these hauntings, let's say, are just people that have lived there and, uh, or, you know, are just coming back or just want to stay uh, versus something negative that wants to harm the people that are in the house. My, my experience is that the, the vast majority of hauntings are, are not malevolent or um, very negative. Um, I think a, a large, I I'd say a good fair percentage, probably half are um, either family members of the people who live there whether they lived there, those other family members had lived there or not, or um, probably even more than half had a connection to the property, whether they lived there, um, had, had a significant event there or something. Um, mm -hmm. my, my experience is that most of the uh, 
times that you have an owner that thinks something is very negative uh, or even inhuman, it tends to be a, a human spirit that just isn't in a good mood or not, you know, not the most polite person. I, I tend to say that if you're a jerk in life, you're, you tend to be a jerk in the afterlife. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people, if they encounter that, they misinterpret that as being inhuman or demonic, et cetera. When in reality, you've just got a jerk. <laughs> I, I agree with you on that one. <clears throat> yeah. I found that many people automatically jump to the far end of the spectrum. Uh, yeah. you know, something. I think we can, and, we can thank the exorcist movies for that. Yeah. 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 That was a little over the top. Yeah. Uh, What's the strangest place you've ever investigated in Carthage? In Carthage, um, hmm. there's, there's, I mean, there, oh, there's, 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 well, uh, first let me give one in, in, in Carthage, um, okay. is, um, an old, old bar and barber shop from the 1800s that is all underground and only accessible by a trap door. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And That's strange. Well, uh, a lot of the uh, downtown area had uh, originally had businesses that were all um, basement level and uh, access separate from street level. And so you, you do have these places that now are basically closed off. And, and this is one of those, but it's, it's, really neat because it's a almost a time capsule because pretty much everything is exactly the way it was in the 1890s down to wow TV on the wall and wallpaper and everything else oh my goodness yeah that's that's amazing yeah the, so cool. what uh, what was going on there um the uh, the the building above it um is a business and they would have various activity, hearing voices, et cetera, hearing, um, by sound like people walking through the building, um, doors opening and closing, uh, that couldn't be explained by, you know, airflow, that kind of thing. And so they, they were real curious, uh, you know, about what, what the cause was. Of course it was an old building to begin with, but, um, but very curious if that had anything to do with it. And, um, one, one curiosity is, is that we did find um, lots of animal bones uh, buried under the, uh, the floorboards. Oh, now that's strange. Yeah, I, it was almost like it would be a, almost like remnants from a butcher shop or something. But as far as anyone could tell, there's never been one there. Oh, that's very strange. Yeah. Good thing there weren't uh, human bones. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no human but, bones. But uh, right. cat, cattle and 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 uh, and pig bones and everything, and they they basically were all, uh, under the floorboards in the in the uh, in the basement. Um, full body apparition there as well. Um, just a real just an interesting place because you don't typically get something all closed off like that. When you investigated, did you get any evidence on tape? Uh, yes, there uh, we we did not not a lot of um, photographic or video uh, evidence. There were some odd light anomalies that kind of hard to pin down one way or another, you know. But uh, certainly interesting. But we did get EVPs that um, indicated that there was a man there by the name of Rodney and he said several times that he wanted to speak, but he never told us a lot of information. <laughs> oh, okay. He just wanted to be heard, huh? Apparently he just, I, I think he just wanted to be acknowledged. So, uh, and the owners of the building uh, still say that things happen that they think it are, are Rodney, you know, so he's still there. They think so. Okay. So you also have a book called Honda Joplin. Yes. Obviously, we know what the theme is. What are <laughs> some of the strangest places there that you've investigated? Oh, um, I've investigated, you know, Peace Church Cemetery. I've uh, 
investigated uh, some of the sites related to the uh, 2011 Joplin tornado. Um, one interesting place was a former ice house. Uh, it was an ice house during the 1800s and early 1900s during the mining days. And it served as a, as a temporary morgue when, when there were uh, fatalities in the mines. People, they would bring the bodies to the ice house to keep them cold until they could be, the bodies could be claimed. Um, that was an interesting, oh, wow. that was an interesting one and had quite a bit of activity. Uh, and did seem to be centered on that time period, you know, uh, people connected to mines and, and to the early days of the town. Would, were you able to get any EVPs uh, from uh, we, there? Or? We did. Um, we did get, uh, did get some and, uh, that were related to, you know, that they, that they knew they had passed and they'd been hurt, uh, injured, and things like that. Before you go out on an investigation, do you do anything to uh, help protect yourself and your team? Um, we we are big believers in grounding yourself. Um, um, I tend to meditate. Um, other team members do as well. I uh, and if we have members that are, are various uh, belief systems, and but we all but we all basically go through a grounding and spiritual uh, sort of process to make sure that we are uh, grounded in a good frame of mind. Um, it's not unusual for us to uh, cleanse afterwards, depending on events during the uh, investigation as well. Yeah, that's important. That's good. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been on a number of television shows, mm -hmm. including uh, Death Walker, Strange World, mm -hmm. Ghost Hunters, Monsters and Mysteries in America, Twisted Believers, My Ghost Story Caught on Camera, which I want to hear about, uh, The Haunted Collector. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've just got a, a question about how is it working with these shows? Do they... Uh, give a good representation of what you're trying to express or do they cut out most of it before it airs? Um, I've, I found that I've had different experiences, <laughs> varying experiences on that, on that point. Um, mm -hmm. I think one thing that a lot of people don't think about is that all of the shows tend to have a certain perspective. Um, um, and People don't often think about, I mean, you're in the same boat that shows showrunners tend to call people like you and I looking for locations. And, and it's often of we are looking for something that fits this bill. You know, this is what we're looking for mm -hmm. uh, this season. And um, I think some are better than others about, you know, portraying what really happened. And some are more. Um, bent on making it fit, you know, the, the motif that they're looking for, you know? Yeah. 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 I, I've had some experience with that. So I totally yeah. understand. And you can never go into it thinking it's going to be perfect. Uh, no, when it's, when it's done. No, but it's, it's fun. <laughs> it, it, it is fun. Yeah. And it gets and the information out there. It's information out there, and, and I always look at it. Hopefully, it uh, helps give exposure to locations, and especially locations that do public events and, and invite teams in. And you just ha you just kind of have to roll with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, tell us about this, my, my ghost story caught on camera. Uh, episode three, season six, Little Ghosts on the Prairie. What was that about? Uh, that was at a Civil War era home in the Carthage, Missouri area, uh, Kendrick House. Um, and um, it was built in the, in the late 1840s and only one of three houses in the area that survived the Civil War because so much oh. of South Missouri was burnt um, during that time and both sides used a scorched earth policy. And um, it was 
lived in by the same family until the 1980s and then turned into a museum. And I've worked with them for uh, a lot of years. And then I'm, I'm on the board of directors now as well. Uh, interesting that there are still people involved that are part of the family. So it's, you know, basically a dredge line from the 1840s to now. Oh uh, my. Yeah. And it's, it's very active. Um, there you get evidence um, consistently over time of about 12 different uh, voices uh, repeatedly, plus others occasionally. Um, and, several different uh, presences that are connected to the family and some that aren't. It was also a field hospital during the civil war. It was mm. a sick house, a community sick house before there were hospitals. Um, midwives would come birth uh, babies there. So they literally have no idea how many people uh, lived and died there. And so it, it's quite active, but two of the spirits uh, that are pretty active. There are two little girls that, uh, were in the family. And so that that's the the reference and the title of the episode. I see. And mm -hmm. did you experience anything uh, during the filming of the TV show? Um there there were some experiences during the filming um uh, being touched um some EVPs etc. but um uh, and they they also used evidence that we already had as well. Um and mm -hmm. uh, it, it is, it's probably one of my one or two top favorite locations, period. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm interested in uh, The Ghost Hunters, Episode 5, A Fright at the Opera. What's that about? Um, it, it, it actually, it was also in, in Carthage, Missouri, at, uh, at the uh, old um, uh, opera house on the square. And uh, it's one that actually um, the uh, they got chased down the staircase by Shadow Man. There, um, it's it is very very active. Uh, the building was built on site of two buildings that were destroyed uh, during the Civil War, um, and then there was a prominent murder in the building as well as other things. Um, so you get apparitions, including. Um, an app apparition of a couple that are in um, Victorian evening wear, like they're going to the to the uh, opera, um, that people encounter and think they're real until they get up close and they disappear. They've actually had people run out of the building yelling they're not real before. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a there's a man that's seen. Um, standing in one of the opera house windows and it looks like he's dressed in a, a gray suit. Um, actually he's been caught on camera um, where you can actually see through him. You can, cause he's standing in front of the curtains and you can see the fold of the curtains through him. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah. There's a little girl that, there that uh, in some ways I think she's probably my favorite that, um, for, for a long time, this little girl uh, is seen in several different buildings in the downtown area. Uh, the common factor is that all of the buildings had entrances to the underground tunnels and caves under Carthage at one time. And most people assume that there's a, a legend that in the 1920s, some kids got down into the caves and didn't make it out. They couldn't find them. So um, it was assume that she was one of those kids. But we found in research that while the opera house was being built in 1878, they had dug the, the pit for the basement, but they hadn't pumped the water out from the tunnels yet. And there was a carriage accident and a woman and her young daughter were thrown into the pit and washed away and they never found them. And so oh. I, I really think that that's who it is. Um, you get a lot of EVPs mm -hmm. that for her um, asking for mama, where's mama, that kind of thing. Um, she's been seen in other buildings and to the point of people thinking a, a kid's locked in the building and calling the police. Um, we actually had the local police department uh, intercede asking one of the building owners 
if they would let us in because they were so tired of being called out on false alert calls. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, so I've, actually, I've actually seen her um, image on security uh, footage that, that officers have shared with me uh, oh, wow. in, in, in a different building. Uh, I've um, I had one experience with her that the, the most vivid was we were, up in the opera house and we're getting ready for an investigation. We're getting ready to, we were walking down the back staircase uh, to the main floor and there were four of us. And as we're walking down, we hear behind us uh, a young girl yell, wait. Oh. And to the point that you think, you know, that that's not, that's not disembodied. That's someone yelling. Mm -hmm. We go back up, search the entire you know, floor, there's no one there. Um, oh, and my. So, yeah. So there, there's quite a bit of things there. Um, there's a shadow man there that seems very protective. Uh, and that's what seems to have chased <laughs> a couple of the ghost hunter uh, cast down the staircase. And actually, if you watch the episode, they, they, they do show that where they run. Oh, we'll have to find that. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think is the reason for all of these active hauntings in Carthage? I think, well, I, 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 I think it's kind of twofold. One, you, you had a lot of things happen with the civil war and so forth. So you had, you had a lot of, you had a lot of death, a lot of, um, of, uh, tragedy, uh, just a lot of energy and emotion involved. Mm -hmm. And then to be honest, I think part of it has to do with, um, the geology because um, the whole area is a limestone plateau mm -hmm. and undercut with a lot of underground rivers, uh, lakes, uh, and caves with a very high crystal content in the limestone. And I just, yeah. I, I kind of think it just adds like a, an amplifier of whatever's there. It, it gets amplified. Yes, indeed. That's uh, that's true uh, around uh, and especially around limestone buildings too, mm -hmm. with all of the quartz. Uh, and uh, and, found and, that and to there's be a true. lot of that in this area too, because um, quarries in the, in the Carthage area, in, it's referred to uh, as Carthage marble. It's limestone, but when it's dressed out, it's uh, it looks exactly like marble, and it's called. Carthage marble. In fact, the, uh, the capital in Jefferson city is made of Carthage marble. Yes. I, my, uh, ancestors built two houses, one in Rich Hill and one in Kansas city out of the, the Carthage marble mm -hmm. and they're still standing and they're in perfect condition. They look like yeah. they're brand new. You, exactly. you can't hurt that stuff. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's so it's hard. Been it's there for, for the last. And so I, I really think it's a combination of the things that happened in the area, plus the geology and all of the underground water and moving water. Well, I think it's interesting that you have an interest in history as well as paranormal, because if you're looking at a, a site that is haunted, say you mm -hmm. do want to know what the history was, because that could definitely have some, uh, factor in, involved in why it's being haunted. It, 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 it often does. And, and even if it's haunted by someone that say, isn't, you know, someone that owned it or lived there or whatever, um, the history can often give you context of why someone was there that was connect that had some sort of connection that made them want to come back or stay. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Joplin now your haunted Joplin book, uh -huh. uh, just uh, pick a, a site to talk about. Um, probably. Well, one real quickly and then another, uh, probably the, the, the best EVP um, ever caught was in uh, the library uh, on main street, which is now the old library uh, because they have a new one but it was built on the site of a very luxurious hotel, uh, the Connor Hotel, that was demolished in 1978. And um, ironically, there, there, were, uh, there were a couple of men killed during the construction of, of the hotel with accidents. And they were getting ready to demolish the hotel 
and three men, it was the night before it was to come down and three men were still in the, ba- they were in the basement still prepping things and it came down early. Um, and uh, two of them passed. Um, and um, um, so then afterwards they built a library on it and uh, always had a lot of activity. We investigated a number of times and, and uh, but uh, two of the really interesting things that happened there. One was um, we were uh, doing an EVP session and one of the investigators asked if Mr. Connor was there who owned the, the hotel um, as well as the hotel that was there before him, before that one. And um, we didn't get Mr. Connor, but we got a, uh, a male voice with a very heavy Irish brogue hmm. that says very clearly, oh, he and I have been known to, and he just starts chuckling and mumbling. Sounds like he's had one or two pints and feeling really good. Mm-hmm. And it very much came across of like, oh, yeah, I know, Tom. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, another thing there is that uh, as with a lot of hotels, people would check in to check out. Um, and back in the day, they didn't always put it in the paper. Um, but there was an account um, late in the hotel's uh, history of um, a concierge retiring who had worked there for over 50 years. And he recounted that he knew of 10 suicides for sure. And he was the uh, unlucky fellow that when they had someone that didn't check out, um, of course it was built in 1906, had transoms over the, uh, the doors and everything. He was small enough that he got sent through the transom windows to unlock the door and find out what was going on. So he tended to find the bodies. Oh no. And and he discussed um, the one that, affected him the most was a lady, a well-dressed lady who checked into a room on the eighth floor, had ordered a milkshake and then uh, drank her milkshake and then jumped out the window. Um, So one night we're investigating, we have uh, team members and library staff, as well as a couple of local historians uh, with us. And I asked the question, is the lady who ordered the uh, milkshake on the a floor with us. That's all I said. And you get a disembodied wail and sobbing that just filled the whole area, the whole main area of the library to the point everybody turned around to where it was coming from. Um, oh yeah, that, that was, that was pretty neat. Um, Another location uh, was the uh, Olivia Apartments. It was very luxurious apartments that built in 1906 that, um, you know, car, uh, Italian marble. Um, every apartment was unique, had a different floor plan, had a different uh, fireplace, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, about a year and a half after it was built, there was a very tragic explosion a uh, young desk clerk, 20 year old uh, fellow named Marvin Reynolds. Um, he was the night clerk and at uh, five o'clock in the morning, he would do nightly rounds in the basement, um, just checking on things they had. There were businesses down there and then they had storage for tenants and so forth, plus the boiler and furnace and all that. And they had a building, a uh, cat down there uh, to keep mice down. And, um, So, um, and he, so he would go down and feed the cat. And at the time, all of the, uh, the uh, lighting and everything in the building was natural gas, which was not uncommon, but this was Mm -hmm. before they put odor in natural gas. Uh So Marvin goes down, he hits a light switch, nothing happens and he strikes a match and it ignites the gas. There'd been a leak, uh, the boiler, explodes uh, a fireball is sent through the hallways and actually up through one of the first uh, floor apartments um, uh, severely injuring the couple who live there um, and um, 
poor Marvin was blown through a brick wall. Um, one of the other uh, first floor tenants was a doctor and he, he, the explosion happened. He ran to the lobby and realized he wasn't there and figured he was downstairs. So he later testified that when he got to the bottom of the stairs, where Marvin was, was about 12 feet from the bottom of the stairs uh, up against a pillar. Uh, but it was so smoky and hot and everything. It took him 10 minutes to find him. And when he found him, he was still alive, uh, but burned so badly that his skin is peeling off and his knuckles are falling out. Oh. Um, but saying, and, and the doctor carried him upstairs and there was nothing he could really do for him, but he, he lasted about 30 minutes. And he said repeatedly, please don't tell my folks. Um, and tell Mr. Bendelari it wasn't my fault. And that, that was the owner of the building. And then repeatedly cursed that damn cat. Uh, oh. <laughs> and um, and uh, Marvin definitely seems to still be there. He's been seen in the building as well as in houses around the building, usually at 5 a.m. And one witness in a nearby house um, who I know, uh, actually, I knew her uh, way before this, and, and she related it to me. She woke up one morning, and it was about right at five, and she just felt, you know, like someone was in her room, and she rolls over, and she said there was a man standing there with most of his clothes burned off of him, and his skin is peeling and off and just bloodied with his hands over his face, you know, in a defensive posture like that. And he was there for you know, 15, 20 seconds and then disappeared, which would make perfect sense. And then another thing that would happen would be that you would find bare footprints uh, in different places in the building. Um, and the building, by the time we were investigating and doing tours and so forth, had been, it was empty. It was being um, worked on in stages, but so you'd have dusty floors. And you'd walk into a room and there would be bare footprints um, and they measured out to about a size 10 man's shoe. Um, but there would be not a speck of dust in those footprints, almost as if they were wet, you know, wow. all the dust. But it would start, say, in the middle of a large room and then walk towards a wall and as if they would walk through the wall. And they it'd be in places that there's no way someone could get there without disturbing other dust and everything to be a hoax. And uh, mm -hmm. that was always very interesting. <laughs> it, it's interesting how a uh, spirit can m materialize enough to leave a footprint mm -hmm. behind or, or say move something Yeah, or, t or you feel their touch mm -hmm. and it, you're, it you know, they're in, in spirit world. That's, that's just, it's still, it amazes me. I, you know, I, I see it all the time or hear about it all the time. Uh, and it's just incredible that, that that can happen. It really is. And in this situation, it's very obvious that it's not someone trying to trick people or anything because there's no way there was, there would be no way in most of the cases that they could have created those steps without leaving other evidence short of someone getting a crane in there and setting someone in the middle of a very large room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which would be impossible. Exactly. Why do you think that the spirits come back to places or, or haunt a place? I think a lot of times it's because there, there is some sort of connection, whether, you know, I think like in that case for Marvin, you know, uh, obviously his death, but, you know, just so much emotion expended there. Um, and um, sometimes it's because it was a place they really, you know, loved, you know, maybe they lived in. Or sometimes I think it's just a place that made them feel good, kind of like, you know, haunted fancy hotels that, you know, someone checked in to check out or some place that they just enjoy going that I kind of, I don't know, I kind of look at it. I would rather, um, I would rather be at a very beautiful place or uh, uh, mm -hmm. tranquil place than 
hanging around a tombstone, you know. Um, and I think it kind of just depends on that person, what, what would make sense for them where they'd be. I think that's a good explanation. Um, the spirits that return to sites, you know, places that they've lived in before, mm -hmm. sometimes they, they don't want to leave because they are so attached to that house. Mm -hmm. um, I found that with older people, especially that they've lived in a house for a long, long time. Uh, do you suggest to them that they should move on or, or, or do you have any conversation like that with them? Well, I kind of look at it that if, if it is an intelligent haunting, if it's interactive, um, I, I think I, to me, it's kind of rude and presumptuous for us to say, Oh, you need to leave. Um, um, and various people have, you know, different ideas of, Oh, they're supposed to do this or that. Well, we don't really know. I mean, we literally, until we, it happens to us ourselves, we have no idea what the rules on the other side are. And there's a lot of situations where it seems that you have entities that cross over the veil and then come back, back and forth. Um, so I don't presume that I know what they're supposed to do, but I find that often there's a compromise if, if they're really attached and want to be in a place that often there can be a, a compromise of, okay, you know, the, the new owners, the people who are here now, they, they don't want to be disturbed at night or, you know, not in their bedroom, that kind of thing. And often you can reach a compromise if it seems to be uh, interactive and intelligent. Um, and I think a lot of them don't even realize that they're bothering someone. They're kind of doing their own thing mm -hmm. and um, kind of oblivious that it affects whoever else is there is kind of my finding. Do you ever have to explain to a spirit that they've passed on a, a one that might not understand that they are dead? I, again, I don't think that's my place. Um. I think that's I think that's human ego being presumptuous that um, I, I think that most do know anyway um, and make a choice. I think it's very rare for one to not know. Um, they may just not talk about it much. But again, I, I, I kind of view it that we don't really know we presume we understand the physics and the dynamics on the other side, but um, I mean, it's, it's kind of like the cautionary movies where the, the, the kids always know the real answers and the adults are the idiots uh, trying to make the rules and, and making it worse. We mm -hmm. could be doing that. Um, and so I just, mm -hmm. I take the viewpoint that it's not my place to try to make someone do something or, you know, Oh, by the way, you know, you are dead. Um, also, it also presupposes that it's a lingering spirit. Um, and I think there's a lot of times that activity is more a function of time and space bumping up against each other so that we're getting a glimpse of a point in time in the past and they may be getting a glimpse of us too. So in that situation, yeah. saying dead, leave, and doesn't make any sense. It'd be the same for them since telling us your dad leave. So, mm -hmm. so I, 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 I tended, yeah. I, I tend to not go there simply for the fact that um, we may have unintended consequences from not really understanding the situation. You mentioned time and space. Mm -hmm. I had a case a few years ago where a, a girl died and her two friends uh, would see her mm -hmm. every year on the, the anniversary of her death. Mm -hmm. And that was the only time that they would see her. She would either, she would appear in the car with them. She'd appear in one of their houses. She would appear if they were out at a bar somewhere, she would appear at oh, the yeah. bar. Um, have you ever run into any case like that? Um, I, I've, I, I've had one where, um, it wasn't necessarily the only time that there was a uh, appearance by this, this entity, but that uh, her death date did seem to 
always have a sort of a, a stronger presence or a stronger uh, activity. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and that may just be, again, maybe kind of revisiting that moment. Um, we really don't know how the other side experiences time, you know, so it could be that, you know, that moment has significance. So they revisit it. Or if you look at it from quantum physics, every point in time coexists past, present and future. So right. if that's the case, theoretically, they could visit any point in time whenever they want. Yeah, it's hard to wrap your mind around some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that's yeah. why I that's why I, t I I try not to presume what 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 you know telling them information that they aren't aware of. And frankly, they may be a, aware of a lot more information than they're telling us. <laughs> right. I, yeah. Right. Now you are the uh, a producer and a writer of the Dark Ozarks TV series. What is that all about? Well, yeah, I'm I'm co-producer, co-executive producer with Josh Heston, and you know Josh. Um, and um, basically, Dark Ozarks is a TV show in development uh, that highlights dark history, mysteries, uh, legends, and the paranormal in the Ozarks region. That sounds absolutely fascinating, and I can't wait for it to to be out. <clears throat> I'm sure you can't mention the network yet, just yet. I but, can't um, know. We look Under forward to that. So as soon as you do know, if you'll let me know, I'll, I'll, I'll put the word out on my end too. I certainly will. And you've got, uh, you still have uh, several books. Let me just uh, show uh, these four books, Haunted Carthage, Missouri, Wicked Route 66. What is that about? Oh yeah, Missouri's uh, Wicked Route 66. It's uh, gangsters and outlaws on the mother road, uh, and it's oh, all yeah. um, sort of the the darker side of Route 66. We're so used to Route 66 being, you know, all Americana and kitsch, motels, diners, etc. Um, but there was a lot more that went on, um, and it's it's been full of outlaws and contraband, uh, etc. Since day one. Uh, and a few ghost stories are thrown in there too. Oh, that sounds fascinating. And then of course we've got, um, civil war ghosts of Southwest Missouri and haunted Joplin. Mm -hmm. Do you have any more books in the works by the way? Um, actually I, I do. I've, I'm, I'm, um, working on one that is based on uh, some real events and then, um, there uh, we are in the process of writing a series of dark Ozarks books and hopefully the first one will be out later this year. Well, that sounds absolutely fascinating. How can people get in touch with you and uh, the paranormal science lab and get your books? Uh, books are available pretty much uh, on any book site, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, etc., or in, in the region, a lot of the local bookstores. Uh, to get in touch with us, you can go to the website paranormalsciencelab.com and uh, get in touch with us. Uh, we're also active on Facebook under Paranormal Science Lab, and you you can contact Dark Ozarks um, the same way on Facebook, Instagram, or the website. So, okay. Then I've got a couple of graphics here. Tell us what these are. I uh, just. Uh, logo for dark ozarks um and just highlighting that we we look at the noir side of history and in the legends um so if you like, and and again that's just sort of another logo highlighting that we we uh bring stories to light that you know often are you know left in the darkness and making the connections that you don't always uh see between different things well, those are really great logos. I like them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as a, a final note, what advice would you give to someone who is just getting started in paranormal? I would say um, talk to other people who, you know, around you, they investigate. Um, and, you know, if you, if you can go along with them or if there's public events and don't stop with just one or one team, um, find, find a, 
a fit because, you know, not everyone approaches everything the same way and um, go in with your head first uh, and not expecting thrills and adrenaline. Um, uh, lots of, you know, mm -hmm. research, grounding, um, know what you're getting into. Really good advice. Thank you so much for being on the program with me this evening, Lisa. And of course, um, we do not want to miss your talk about <laughs> the Hornet spook light and, and that area next weekend at the XCon. Yes, I'm, so. I'm really looking forward to that. It's cited. And thank you for inviting me for that. Sure thing. And I can't wait to hear it. This is Margie K with Unex News, and we'll see you here again next week. You've been listening to the Unex News Podcast with Margie K. Any rebroadcast or duplication of this program or its content without express written permission from Unex Media or Margie K herself is strictly prohibited. The Unex News Podcast, in direct cooperation with the internet website, unexmedia.com.